In this video, you're going to learn the ugly truth about prototyping a new product. Each stage of taking a new product from idea to manufacturing will have different prototype requirements. Unfortunately, no single prototype is sufficient for bringing a commercial product all the way to market. No matter how advanced computer-aided design has become, your new product will need multiple prototype iterations before being ready for mass manufacturing. In this video, you're going to discover how to, how to build the various prototypes required to go from idea to production for a modern product that requires both electronics and a plastic enclosure. Prototyping your product is really all about learning. Each time you create a new prototype version, you will, or at least you should, learn something new. Always start with the simplest, cheapest way to prototype your product. Then, with each prototype iteration, you should progress closer and closer to a pr production quality prototype. During the early stages of prototyping, it will be best to separate your product into different types of prototypes, each with its own goal. I'm going to review all of the different stages of prototyping that you will likely need along your path to market. Hi, I'm John Teal with Predictable Designs. Okay, let's get started. For most products, you're going to start with what is called a proof of concept prototype or just POC prototype for short. A proof of concept prototype is, as the name implies, an early stage prototype for proving the basic concept of the product. A POC prototype rarely functions exactly like the final product and it almost will never look like the final product. It has only one goal, and that is to prove the fundamental concept of the product at the lowest cost possible. For the majority of electronic hardware products, a PSC prototype will be built on an electronics development kit such as an Arduino or Raspberry Pi. A PSC prototype is usually mainly used to determine the practicality of a new product idea. Creating a proof of concept prototype makes the most sense if you have fundamental questions about whether your product can actually solve the intended problem. If there are multiple ways to solve a target problem, but you are unsure of which solution is best, then a POC prototype can provide a lot of valuable insight. Fundamental questions are much better determined by a POC prototype than with a custom prototype. Most large tech companies bypass the POC stage entirely, primarily because it's quicker. It's a quicker path to market to start with a production version. But large companies also have a lot more money than you do, or at least most likely, so they can take expensive shortcuts that your average startup just can't afford. Some design engineers will even scoff at the, the concept of a proof of concept prototype because they know they are rarely similar to the final production version. However, if you have fundamental questions or concerns about your product solution and you have a limited budget, then creating a proof of concept prototype is time well spent. The next stage of prototyping a product is to build what's called a looks like prototype. So a, a common prototyping strategy for electronic products especially is to separate the appearance and feel of your product from the functionality. These are called a looks like prototype and a works like prototype. So a looks like prototype focuses on the look, feel, form, and aesthetics of the product. For your looks like prototype, you'll be using prototyping techniques such as foam, clay, 3D printing, CNC machining, and eventually injection molding. Optimizing the look, form, feel, and aesthetics of a product is the purpose of a looks like prototype. Most looks like prototypes are created with 3D printing technology, which is an additive process. This means material is added in layers to form the final shape. It looks like prototype focuses on the exterior of your product, which will be made of plastic or metal. On the other hand, a works like prototype focuses on the internal electronics or the functionality of the product. When prototyping a new product, you should separate the appearance of the product from the function of the product. While they may seem overly simple, don't neglect old techniques like foam and clay, which can be very helpful in the beginning stages. Both of these technologies uh, allow you to quickly and cheaply transform a concept into something you can actually hold in your hand. Using foam or clay can be the cheapest and easiest way to experiment with the size, shape, and feel of your product. With my own product, my earliest prototypes were made of clay. These clay models gave me critical feedback about how the product actually feels in the user's hands. 
Starting with clay prototypes may also reduce the number of prototype iterations that you will need when you do eventually upgrade to 3D printing. Always start out with the simplest, cheapest methods of prototyping. Learn as much as you can from low-cost prototypes before you migrate to more advanced prototyping technologies. As you work your way up the prototyping technology hierarchy, you will find that design changes become more and more complicated to implement. Clay prototypes are trivial to change. 3D printed prototypes are moderately complex and expensive to modify, and injection molding prototypes are the most complex and expensive to modify. So above all, keep things simple and learn as much as possible before you upgrade to a, a new prototype technology. By far, the most common method of producing a looks like prototype is 3D printing. 3D printing is an additive prototyping process that adds material to create the desired shape. The, third three, the term 3D printing is broadly used to refer to various prototyping technologies. And this includes FDM, SLA, and SLS printers. But I'm, I'm not gonna go into all the technical details of these different 3D printing technologies in this video. And I have other uh, content that focuses on 3D printing. The opposite of an additive process is a subtractive process. As the name implies, a subtractive process removes material to form the desired shape. So the process starts with a solid block of plastic or metal and then material is carved away to form the final sculpted prototyping or prototype using what is known as computer numerical control or just CNC machining. One of the primary advantages of CNC machining compared to 3D printing is that you have much more flexibility on the material used. Not only can you create prototypes from plastic or metal, but you can select very specific plastic resins which precisely match the material you will use for mass production. Now we're going to look at building a works-like prototype. And a works-like prototype is focused on the functionality of your product, which for most electronic products means the internal electronics. A proof-of-concept prototype can be considered an early version of a works-like prototype. But now it is time to jump from a proof of concept prototype to a production level works like prototype. This means in most cases abandoning the use of development kits like an Arduino or Raspberry Pi. And you now need to develop a custom printed circuit board to hold and connect all of the product's discrete electronic components. Developing a custom PCB for your works like prototype requires significant engineering design experience. Engineers are expensive and the development of this custom PCB is commonly the most expensive development cost you will face. How you begin prototyping your product's electronics depends on what questions you are trying to answer. Every time you create a new prototype, you should have well-defined questions that the prototype should answer. If you have broad questions about whether your product will even work or whether it will solve the intended problem, then you should have already started with an early works-like prototype based on a development kit such as an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. If there are no big questions about your product's functionality, then you should probably move right into designing a custom printed circuit board. Most large companies developing products begin with a custom PCB. This is the fastest route to market, but it is also usually a much more expensive route. Now in the next prototyping stage, it's time to build what's called a works-like, looks-like prototype. And a, a works-like, looks-like prototype is also sometimes called an engineering prototype. And it's the first time that appearance and functionality come together in a single prototype. Once you have an engineering prototype, you finally have something of sufficient quality to show big customers and investors. However, I always encourage you to get feedback from end users as early as possible, even before you have a fully functional final prototype. This is when it becomes a bit more practical to seek outside investors. By this stage, you've moved past most of the engineering and manufacturing risk. Investors obviously love this reduction in risk. For my own product, I funded the, the product development myself up to this stage. I used my prototype to get a large national retailer interested in my product. And then from there, I leveraged that success to find a manufacturer willing to fund the remaining prototyping stages. An engineering prototype is close to the production prototype, 
but it still hasn't been tested or prepared for mass production. The next prototyping stage that we're gonna look at is optimizing your pre-production prototype. So the pre-production prototype is also a works like, looks like prototype, but one that has been optimized for mass production. This is very close to the final product your customers will eventually see. In most cases, it should also include the retail package if the product will be sold via retail outlets. Although the pre-production prototype may look and function very similar to the works like, looks like prototype, or what we call the, also an engineering prototype, the key difference between the engineering prototype and the pre-production prototype that we're talking about now is manufacturability. During product development, many entrepreneurs and developers underestimate the work needed to migrate from a prototype to a product which can be efficiently manufactured. Making a few prototypes is completely different than manufacturing millions of units. In most cases, considerable additional design effort is required to prepare the design for mass production. For example, 3D printing, or in some cases CNC machining, are typically used when prototyping the product's enclosure or any other custom plastic parts. But for mass manufacturing, high-pressure injection molding will be the technology used to produce the enclosure. 3D printing and CNC machining are very forgiving technologies, and you can prototype just about any shape of plastic you can imagine. But I cannot stress enough that this is not the case with injection molding. Injection molding has very strict production requirements. After you finalize your 3D printed prototypes, it will be necessary to further upgrade the design for injection molding. 3D printing is fantastic at producing tens of parts. However, it's not at all practical for producing hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of parts, obviously. Ultimately, injection molding will be necessary to manufacture your product's enclosure in higher quantities. Not surprisingly, the injection molding process starts with the creation of a mold. Molds are machined from metal, and the hardness of the metal determines the mold's lifetime and cost. For prototyping or early production, aluminum molds are generally the best choice. Aluminum molds typically cost a couple thousand dollars each and can produce up to maybe 10,000 parts. So in injection molding, the mold forms two halves that are held together as hot molten plastic is then injected at high pressure into this closed mold. The high pressure is necessary in order to produce fine details in the part. Once the plastic cools and solidifies, the mold is open and the part is removed. Most designs will require significant modifications in order to prepare them for injection molding. Whereas 3D printing can re reproduce just about any shape you can imagine, injection molding has strict design rules that must be followed closely. Be sure whoever designs your enclosure understands injection molding. Otherwise, you are very likely to end up with a product that can be prototyped but not manufactured in high volume, at least not without a major redesign. Reaching the point of having a fully functional, works like, looks like prototype is a huge accomplishment. Woo! So pat yourself on the back once you achieve this milestone. But don't get too excited just yet. The transition from prototype to mass manufacturing is one of the most underestimated steps to bringing a new hardware product to market. Now we move on to the various types of prototypes required for setting up manufacturing for mass production. Once you have a finished pre-production prototype, it's time to begin testing it to validate that everything works exactly as specified. The first stage of this testing is called engineering validation testing or EVT. This stage of testing focuses on the electronics. Typically between 10 to 50 units will be tested during the EVT stage. The EVT will include testing the basic functionality, but also doing various stress tests to ensure that there are no hidden problems. This includes power, thermal, and EMI testing. The goal of the EVT is to validate that your prototype meets the functional, performance, and reliability specifications. The next prototyping stage for setting up manufacturing is called the Design Validation Test, or DVT. And the DVT is one of the most complex stages. Its goal is to ensure the product meets any necessary cosmetic and environmental specifications. A significantly larger number of units will be needed 
then for the EBT stage, and typically you're looking at 50 to a couple hundred units. These units will be very aggressively tested, including drop, fire, and waterproof testing. Validating that the product is durable enough to withstand day-to-day -day use is one of the primary goals of the design validation testing. This is also commonly the stage at which electrical certifications are obtained. This includes certifications such as FCC, CE, UL, and ROHS, to name a few. Because of the cost and time required to obtain the necessary electrical certifications, the process is usually delayed until you get to this DVT stage. This is to ensure that no other design changes are required after certification testing begins. Of course, if any problems are found during the certif certification testing process, then design modifications may be necessary to correct them. Next, we're going to look at production validation and testing, or PVT for short. And this stage will be your first official production run. You will establish a pilot production line with the priority of optimizing your production process. The focus here will be on improving your scrap rate, assembly time, and quality control process by optimizing your production line but not by making any further product design changes unless you find a serious design issue at this stage. A small pilot production run of several hundred units is pretty typical. And if no problems are found, these can be your first units that can actually be sold. 